so let's look at these things called real numbers. Real numbers are, of course, the numbers that you've been working with all your life. There is another set of numbers, the complex numbers, also known as imaginary numbers, which is very poorly named because imaginary makes it seem like they don't exist, they're not real. Well, yes, they're not real numbers, but it doesn't mean they don't exist. They should have come up with a better name, but they didn't, so it is what it is. But anyway, we're just interested in the real numbers at this stage. So we have the set of real numbers. Okay. Basically, a real number is any number that you can place on the number line. Or, to give it its better name, the real number line. The symbol we use for the set of real numbers is an R. Inside the real numbers, we have another couple of sets that are very important. The rational numbers, that symbolized Q. Q? Anyone got any clue why on earth you would symbolize the rational numbers with the letter Q? Because a rational number is any number that can be written as a fraction. And quotient, of course, means divide. And a fraction is dividing. Okay? Then, of course, the other set, and there's no point of intersection, are the irrational numbers. So they're the numbers that you, you can't write as a fraction. Now, they don't actually have a, an abbreviation for irrational numbers. Uh, they could have used I, but for some reason they didn't. So we don't really have a, a commonly accepted abbreviation for the set of irrational numbers. Okay, One way of writing it is like that, though. See, R, so the set of real numbers, backslash, the set of Q numbers, that backslash means not including, or excluding, if you write. So it's the real numbers excluding the uh, rational numbers and you're left with the irrational numbers. So inside the rational numbers we have fractions. Well I said they all can be written as fractions. I guess when I say the word fractions here I'm talking about the ones that don't simplify down to be whole numbers. So you would leave them as a, a fraction. Okay. So they're the whole numbers. Well the ones that aren't whole numbers. Which consequently means we have another set over there that are the whole numbers. We don't call them whole numbers. Whole numbers we might have called them back in primary school. But we have a more sophisticated word, a big, a grown-up word, if you like. Integers. Integers symbolised with Z. You know, hang on, why Z? But I guess they didn't use I, because then you could confuse that with irrational numbers. Zahlen, or well, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but that's German for integer. And so that's where the Z comes from for the set of integers. Now, inside the integers, we have the natural numbers. The natural numbers. And that's symbolized N for natural. And then we have this little set of numbers which just has one number in it, and it's zero. So the natural numbers, another name for that, uh, well, there's a couple of names you could use, I suppose. Uh, one number is, uh, one number, one name you could use, you might have heard of it, is the counting numbers. Yeah? So if I was to say start counting, you wouldn't start at zero, you wouldn't start at negative three, you'd, you'd start at one. And you'd go up by integers, one, two, three, four. So sometimes we call them the counting numbers. Then overlapping all these are the negatives. You could have a fraction that's negative. You could have a rational number that's negative. You could have an integer that's negative. But notice it doesn't overlap the natural numbers. Because remember, the natural numbers were the counting numbers. And it doesn't overlap zero. I mean, you don't have negative zero. But it overlaps. You have all these negative numbers as well. So basically, that's our set of real numbers broken down. So the sorts of things we're interested in, prime factors is, are, are extremely important. They're the, the building blocks of the numbers. And in fact, we just did it with algebra. You know, we factorise, we are doing exactly the same thing, but with actual numbers. So every natural number can be written as a product of its prime factors. So let's pick a simple number there. 324, we could rewrite as 4 times 81, uh, but they're not prime, so we keep going. Uh, so 2 squared, 3 to the power of 4. So that would be it written as its prime factors. 
And then we have a thing called the highest common factor. Okay. Now to find the highest common factor, you write both of the numbers down in terms of its prime factors, and then you take out the common factors. It's just exactly the same as factorising. So 1,176 and 252. Okay, 1,176, 6,196, they keep going. Three twos, they're okay, they're prime. 49 times four, that can keep going. We end up with three times two cubed times seven squared. There's 1,176, 252, uh, 463s, now we can keep going, so we go 2 squared, 3 squared, and 7. So we want the common factors. We're now going to factorise exactly the same as we do with algebra. When we factorise in algebra, we always take out the lowest power. So what do they have in common? 2 squared would be the lowest power of the 2, 3 to the power of 1 would be the lowest of the 2, and 7 to the power of 1 would be the lowest of the 2, and we get 84, 84. So it's exactly the same as we did with algebra, there is no different. So when you're factorising, it's the lowest power that you remove. Lowest common multiple then. This is pretty much the same as when we're finding, uh, when we're, sorry, when we're dealing with fractions and we're saying, oh, what's the, well, we don't call it lowest common multiple, we call it lowest common denominator. Same idea. So again, we write down all the factors. So let's do 48 and 15, for instance. 48, that's 16 threes, 2 to the power of 4 times 3. 15, there's a nice easy one, 3 fives. So lowest common multiple, well when we're doing it with algebraic fractions, we basically said if it's not there, put it down. So it's the same idea. If it's not there, put it down. 2 to the power of 4, I'll put it down. 3, I'll put it down. 3, oh it's already there. 5, I'll put it down. There's my lowest common multiple. So 240. Again, exactly the same idea. We use the highest power. They've got something in common there, it's the highest power. All right, I did a little teaser before. We talked about three. Let's have a look, no cheating this time. No looking at the sheet. The visibility tests. If you get in early, you get the easy ones. Hmm, how do I know if a number's divisible by two? Even. It's an even number, okay, good. Three we mentioned just before. So all the digits will add up to be three. Four. Say that again. So the last two digits are divisible by four. Okay, five, get in quick. Got to end in a five or a zero. Six. You know the answer, it's already there on the screen. Got to add to be a multiple of three, but it's got to be an even number. So it's divisible by both two and three. Then it's got to be divisible by six. Oh, now, if you know this one without looking at the sheet, I will be very impressed. Can anyone tell me the divisibility test for seven? <laughs> All right, here you go, ready? You double the last digit, subtract it from all the other digits, and that, that answer should be divisible by seven. Give me a number that's divisible by seven and don't make it small. <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> we got one? 70. Well, okay, 70. Double the last digit, zero. Subtract it from the other digits. Subtract zero from seven, I get seven. The answer is divisible by seven. Oh, yes, it is. So what do you know? Seven goes into 70. Kind of was thinking of a bit bigger and not as obvious. Was it 100? And 40, that's kind of obvious. <laughs> like, seven goes into 14 and seven goes into one. But, all right, let's test it. Double the last number, 14. Take it away from the other ones, we get zero. Well, zero is divisible by everything, so yes, divisible by seven. Come on, who's got a really good number? Say again, 1,000. 
148. Yeah, see, that's not obvious. That's not obvious, it's divisible by 7. So double the last number, which would be 16. Take it away from the other numbers. So 140 minus 16 is uh, 98, isn't it? Now, even that's not obvious that it's divisible by 7, so let's do it again. 8 twos are 16. Take away from 9, we get negative 7. And negative 7 is divisible by 7. So, yes, it does work. 8, divisibility test for 8. It is similar to the, the 4. Last three digits this time. So last three digits are divisible by eight. Nine. That's right. Because again, you're talking about something that three goes into, but three squared goes into it. So three goes into it and goes into it again. So this time the sum of the digits is divisible by nine. All right, don't all rush at once. It ends in, it ends in a zero. Okay. Oh, 11. This is another tricky one. Bit more commonly known than the seven one, but still not a straightforward one. Anyone know it? Read this very carefully. The sum of the even position digits will equal the sum of the odd position digits, or they will differ by a multiple of 11. So give me a number that 11 goes into. Oh, okay. I'll do. I'll do the one, two, one first. <laughs> now I'll come back to that one. It's good. The big numbers are good. One, two, one. Some of the odd position digits. So one and one is two. Some of the even position digits. Two. It's the same. Divisible by eleven. So what was your one? Two thousand. 761. Sum of the odd, 2 and 6 is 8. Sum of the even, 7 and 1 is 8. Yes, divisible by 11. Okay, so that's how we can look at a number and work out if it's divisible by 11. Um, looking at the space I've got left there, I probably didn't go any further. But there are divisibility tests for 12 and 13 and things like that. Fractions and decimals then. So our real numbers, remember, we could break them down in. Fractions and decimals become very important then. Again, fractions and decimals, they are the same thing, just different ways of writing them. Different ways of writing them. Now, I guess the trickiest one is converting the recurring decimals into fractions. I mean, converting a terminating decimal for rational numbers anyway. So the ones that can be written as fractions are either terminating or recurring. The terminating ones are very easy because you just do exactly what it says. Three quarters, three divided by four, that gets you the decimal. Okay. To go from a decimal to a fraction is very easy because of course we're using our base 10 system and we know, oh, that's the tenths column, that's the hundredths column and, and so on. But this is the one that gets trickier. Let's do one which hopefully we recognise off the top of our heads. 0.6 repeater. For those who are a little bit unsure, that's 0.6666666666. Six, 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 and it just keeps going forever and ever. So we do it via simultaneous equations. So if I let x equal 0.6, which is 0.6666, six, 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 I'm now going to multiply everything by 10. 10x then would be 6.66666. The idea is to get rid of the bit that I can't work out, which is the, all those repeating numbers. So now I can subtract. They go away, and I just get 9x equals 6. So x is 6 on 9. Simplifies down, of course. So we now know 0.6 repeater is 2 thirds. So we want to get rid of that bit of the decimal that we can't work with. Two numbers, so 0.81 repeater, so that's 81, 81, 81, 81, 81, 81, 81, and so on. So same idea, we'll add x equal 0.81 repeater. So x is 0.81818181. In this case, I'm not going to multiply by uh, 10, not going to help me. Because if I multiply by 10, after the decimal point, I won't get 818181, I'll get... One eight, one eight, one eight, one eight, one. No good to me. 
I'm trying to cancel it. But if I multiply by 100 in this case, I'll get the same number behind the decimal point. And so that now will cancel. So 99x is 81. 81 on 99, which again simplifies down. So 9 on 11, 81. Okay. Uh, but what happens if not all the numbers are repeating? So 0 0.327, repeater. So that's 0 0.327, 27, 27, 27, 27, 27. Oh, and by the way, the standard for writing uh, the decimals, if there was three numbers repeating, I wouldn't put three dots. You just put the first dot at the first number that's repeating, second dot at the last number's repeating. Some people, in the, instead of using dots, just draw a horizontal line over all the numbers that repeat. That's another notation. All right, so I'm going to let x equal 0.327272727. I want to get the same number behind. Well, there's no way I'm going to get the 3 behind. So in this case, it's not going to get the same number behind the decimal point. I want to get the same number behind the 3, because that's the bit I can play with and get the same number. So if I multiply by 100, I'll get 32.7, but then after the first decimal place, I get 27272727277. So when I subtract, I get 99x is 32.4. So basically, the key is how many numbers are repeating. One number is repeating, I'll multiply by 10. Two numbers are repeating, I'll multiply by 100. Three numbers are repeating, I'll multiply by 1,000. So the key is how many numbers are actually repeating. 32.4 and 99, but that's ugly. We don't put decimals on for it. We don't mix them. You either write it as a decimal or you write it as a fraction. So it's 324 and 990. Simplifies down to be 18 on 55. Now, that's a lovely technique. But reality is we don't do that. Remember what I've been saying to you, Mass is about patterns. Once we've got a pattern, we can do things a lot quicker. Here we go. Remember our friend 0.6 repeater. I can look at that and say, well, 6 has got to go on the top. Because 6 is the number that's repeating. And uh, 9 will go on the bottom because there's one number that's repeating, so I'm going to write one nine down on the bottom. There's my answer, six on nine, which is two thirds. The next one was 0.81. Oh, okay. Well, on the top, I'll write 81. That's the number that's repeating. On the bottom, I'll write two nines. Now, when I say two nines, I don't mean the number 18. I mean, I'm going to write two nines, a nine and then a nine. And uh, there's my answer, 9 on 11. So if I had 0.7134 repeater, all of the number ones, yeah, I could go and use algebra. But no, I know, looking at it straight away. Oh yeah, that's 7134, that's the number that's repeating, goes on top. On the bottom, I'll write four nines, 9999. Nine, nine, nine. There's the answer. Heck of a lot quicker, just by taking advantage of the pattern and so on. The one that's the pattern where it's uh, not all the numbers are repeating. How do I work out the number? 324 went on top. Why 324? 327. But then I subtract the number that's not repeating. So I subtract the 3. On the bottom, I write 990. Why 990? Two numbers are repeating, so I write down two nines. One number is re not repeating, so I write down one zero. And obviously I put the zero at the end, because if I put it at the front, it would have no effect. So we get 990. So if I had 0 0.1096 repeater, but only the 9 and 6 are repeating, then I know it's going to be 1,086, that's 1,096 minus 10, over 9900. Two numbers repeating, I'll put down two nines. Two numbers not repeating, I'll put down two zeros. And that turns out to be 181 and 1650. As I say, taking advantage of the pattern means I don't have to spend all that time with the simultaneous equation. I can come up with the answer straight away. All right, handful out of 2A. We've got the old Cambridge. We'll spend the rest of the day playing with these.